everyone. Welcome to our discussion this morning. Greetings from beautiful Portugal. I'm so excited to see all of you here. And I'm so excited to be a moderator for the Psilocybin Summit 2020. There's been some really incredible uh, discussions so far. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jessica Grotefeld. I'm the founder of Lucerna Psilocybin Retreat. Uh, we are a spiritual-based plant medicine retreat, and we are, have been created for women by women. And we offer both week-long private and group retreats uh, where participants are invited to experience uh, what it's like to experience plant medicine in a ceremonial setting alongside workshops to provide meaningful tools for optimal psychedelic integration. You can find more information about uh, our work at uh, lucidturnerretreats.com or on our social media under Lucy Turner Retreats. So thank you all for coming. I'm so excited to be here. Before um, I begin, I just want to say a little quick overview of what the discussion will look like today before I introduce our incredible speakers. It's going to be a 45-minute discussion with a PowerPoint, and which will be ex ex um, narrated by Julie and Jerry Brown. And at the very end, we'll be taking um, question and answers at the very end. So if you have questions, please give us a second and do that at the end. <clears throat> you can send messages to me via chat and I will um, choose some of the questions at the end. So if you have any problems um, with the viewing, I want you to pick, click um, speaker view. That way you can see their, their PowerPoint and their faces. Great, so without further ado, I want to begin introducing Julie M. Brown. Welcome, Julie. Thank she you. holds a, thank you for being here. She holds a master's degree in um, counseling psychology and is a licensed mental health counselor during her three decades of work with cancer patients as an integrative psychotherapist. She, used, she uses guided imagery and a variety of other modalities. Julie is also a dedicated researcher documenting the role of sacred mushrooms in world religions. Thank you, Julie, for being here. Next, I would like to introduce Jerry B. Brown, Hello. His PhD. Hello. Um, he served as founding professor of anthropology at Florida International University from 1972 to 2014 where he taught the class Psychedelics in Culture, Past, Present, and Future. Um, this class has been in such high demand that it's going to be offered uh, beginning again in 2021 in the spring. It'll be available fully online. So that'll be something cool for us all to check out. Their work together, they uh, co-authored the book, The Psychedelic Gospels, The Secret History of Hallucinogens in Christianity. And this fascinating book is based on their extensive field research at churches and cathedrals throughout Europe and the Middle East. And it documents the presence of entheogenic mushrooms in early and medieval Christian art, which is fascinating. Today, however, their discussion is entitled Mystical Experience and Psychedelic Assisted Psychotherapy, Insights from Guided Imagery Therapy with Cancer Patients. And so they'll be contrasting Julie Brown's clinical psychotherapy work with her cancer patients with the landmark findings of the 2016 Johns Hopkins psilocybin cancer study. Thank you very much for being here, Julie and Jerry Brown. Thank you, Jessica. All right, so um, I'm gonna take over the uh, view here for a minute and um, talk about our work. Um, The topic for today, and they said uh, all good science begins with a question, is can psychedelic psychotherapy with guided imagery result in full remission, that's cancer-free after five years, of emotionally-based cancers? And uh, this is a big question. I mean, we have some uh, 1.8 million cancers a year. We have some 600,000 people dying of that. Uh, one out of every two women and one out of every three men will contract cancer sometime in their life. 
but it kind of goes in a direction that most of the psychedelic renaissance research has not gone in. Uh, it goes in the direction of looking to the question of can psychedelic psychotherapy actually affect a cure or a remission of a physiological disease? How did we even come to this question? Well, out of our research on magic mushrooms in Christian art, which are documented photographically in our book, we became very aware of the role of mystical experience um, in world religion, and then obviously Christianity within theogens being a portal to the divine. As a result, we became very interested in the research of Johns Hopkins, the psilocybin therapy sessions that alleviated anxiety and depression, because as it turns out, mystical experience was the key to that particular outcome. Then in having conversations with Julie, um, the aha moment was when we realized, or I realized, she knew this all along, that her guided imagery sessions with cancer clients had occasioned, had generated mystical experiences that were also the key to healing without psychedelics. Combining that clinical knowledge with our reading of the psychedelic literature, and uh, many people are probably familiar with uh, Johns Hopkins research and Griffith's work, uh, maybe less familiar with the LSD psychotherapy with terminal cancer patients that Stanislav Grof and his first wife, Joan Halifax, uh, did in the late 1960s, early 70s, and wrote up in 1977 in a very important book called The Human Encounter with Death. Our work, Julie's work, is really what Jim Fadiman would call search. Why search as opposed to research? Because this is not based on any standardized protocol, any direct measurements. It just comes out of clinical observations, very much in the same way that the uh, microdosing experiences that people are reporting to Jim Fadiman are uncontrolled. So what happens out of that is he identifies fascinating issues that can then be put into the context of official research. Um, this is a favorite quote of mine from the Carlos Castaneda books, The Teachings of Don Juan, uh, where Don Juan says, for me, there's only the traveling of paths that have heart. And on that path that has heart, and on the only, and the only worthwhile challenge is to traverse its full length. And there I travel looking, looking breathlessly. Well, for Julie and me, who started our psychedelic uh, journeys back in the 60s and 70s, we are 50 years later looking, traveling this, still traveling this path and looking, looking breathlessly. Albert Hoffman said, called uh, psychedelics, called LSD his problem child. Uh, Stanislav Grof said, well, I think LSD is a child prodigy born into a dysfunctional family. And obviously what's happening now in the psychedelic renaissance is healing that relationship of psychedelics with the world family. And it's very exciting uh, to be a part of that. Uh, there's really a second coming of psychedelics happening after the first thrust of the 40s and 50s and 60s. And uh, it's very rare uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald said, look, there's no second acts in American lives. Well, psychedelics is certainly having uh, a second act, and I, it looks very much like we're going to get it right this time. Uh, speaking about second comings, our work is found uh, in our book, uh, Does Christianity Have a Psychedelic History? The Psychedelic Gospels, uh, which, as Jessica introduced, uh, documents through photographs of psychedelic icons Amanita muscaria, and psilocybin varieties in early and medieval Christian art. So here's the key quote that comes out of the Johns Hopkins study, the 20, and also NYU. Related to the alleviation of anxiety and depression. In both trials, the intensity of the mystical experience described by patients correlates with the degree to which their depression and anxiety 
decreased. Now let's let's think about this for a minute. What we have are, in effect, white coated shamans working in a clinical laboratory using synthetic psilocybin and entheogen to induce predictably a mystical experience, bringing together science and religion, which for many decades have seemed to be antagonists to each other. Let's let this enigma sink in for a moment because this is seminal to the issues we're looking at here. We were not surprised, Julie, nor, neither Julie nor I, to learn about the role of mystical experience and the ability of psychedelics to induce or occasion them because there have been three seminal studies about psilocybin and mystical experience, two of which we discussed in our book, The Psychedelic Gospels. The first was the miracle of Marsh Chapel, also known as a Good Friday experiment conducted by Walter Pankey, uh, then a graduate student in Timothy Leary's Harvard Psilocybin uh, Project. And this research was conducted literally in Marsh Chapel, uh, a chapel on the campus of Boston University. And on Good Friday, uh, Pankey and his associates, his observers, took a group of 20 Protestant divinity students, broke them into two groups, 10 received uh, a high dose of psilocybin, 10 received niacin or B12, which would give you an energy rush. Neither the participants in the study nor the clinical observers knew who was getting the psilocybin and who was getting the control. Nine out of the 10 divinity students who took the psilocybin had a full-blown religious or mystical experience, including Houston Smith, who participated in that study, went on to be a world-famous uh, professor of religion. And he said, this was the most powerful cosmic homecoming I've ever had. Now I understand, truly understand what I've been reading in the Bible all these years, 1962. Uh, 25 years later, Rick Doblin, who many of you will know as the founder of MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, the mothership of psychedelic uh, research and psychedelic science in the United States, uh, did a follow-up study as his PhD dissertation. And he found nine, seven out of the nine students who had the mystical experience. And they still said, 25 years later, this was and continues to be one of the most significant experiences in my life, and I still continue to realize benefits from it. Fast forward through the um, uh, draconian years of the Nixon's Controlled Substances Act, and in 2006 and 2008, uh, at Johns Hopkins, Roland Griffiths and his associates published two key pieces of research on mystical experience and their lasting benefits from two pieces of research they did in 2006, 2008. For those of you who may not know Roland Griffiths, when he came into psychedelic studies, he was already a famous uh, pharmacological researcher that had 300 peer reviewed publications uh, to his credit. Um, now, at the essence of mystical experience, it, the, the mystical experience is the essence of what we're talking about today. It's the key variable, the key factor. And it turns out that quite a while ago, Julie had a mystical experience, and she's going to tell you about it. Yes, I am. Well, I lived in New York City in the late 60s, and I went to, to a music festival with a couple of um, friends of mine. And that was in Philadelphia. And at that time, I was an introspective, insecure 21 year old. And uh, one of my friends gave me a combination of high dose LSD, mescaline, plus DMT. Um, I had, no judgments, please. I had found a place on, on the grassy knoll um, where it was an outside concert, music fest, and ingested the amphiogens. As the first group came on, come on, uh, a gospel group 
I laid back on the grass and closed my eyes and I became very relaxed listening to the soulful music as the sun started to set. After a while, I noticed colorful patterns behind my closed eyes and felt the same tingly feeling in my gut that I had gotten on previous trips. Out of nowhere, though the sky was darkening outside, inside my eyelids, the light was getting brighter and brighter. And suddenly, shockingly, I was traveling outward and upward towards space so fast that I felt like I was shot out of a cannon at the speed of light. I sped on and on, seeing intense flashes of light and color until everything slowed down and the streaks condensed into stars. And as I moved through space, I began to notice that every star had a face and that I recognized every face and felt a loving connection to each and every one. I became aware that my experience was in a cosmic dimension and was unlike any entheogenic encounter I had ever known. I did not dwell on this. I simply experienced the beauty of it all, the utter magnificence of being connected to every particle and person in existence. The next afternoon, when I became conscious of the earthly plane again, I sat up and observed that I was at a music concert and that I had missed the entire event. Almost everyone was gone. But what I left with, what I was left with, was some profound alterations of my mind and body. I was much less afraid of everything, even death. I felt free and at peace. Most importantly, I realized I was connected to every living thing and felt much more love for myself and for life, all of life. Although this experience of cosmic consciousness took place over 50 years ago, it produced beneficial changes in my life that I am still grateful for today. And it changed my entire life's path. It's a lot to take in. And for those of you who had some form of a mystical experience, uh, starting out with Panky's research and moving on to the Johns Hopkins research, uh, they developed, refined, validated a 30 question questionnaire, the Mystical Experience Questionnaire 30, that they could give to uh, someone who had a psychedelic experience to try to evaluate uh, was it a mystical experience and was it a complete mystical experience? Uh, the five key elements are unity and sacredness, uh, an incredible sense of unity and coming away with a profound sense of reverence, a positive mood, a sense of peace and deep tranquility, a transcendence of time and space beyond past, present, future. There's something completely authoritative and authentic about this experience that is just undeniable to the person of either hearing their true voice or get it, getting information that they know is completely true. And as you can garner from, from Julie's expression of this experience, it's inevitable, ineffable, it's indescribable. It's very difficult to put into words or to communicate completely to another person. So let's come back to the Johns Hopkins study, the 2016 uh, study of could psilocybin reduce anxiety and depression and also fear of death in cancer patients. Uh, they had 51 patients, 
about a third of them suffering from depression, a third from anxiety, and a third with, with mixed. Uh, some were dealing with recurring cancers, some were dealing with possible cancers. The high dose in this study was 22 to 30 um, milligrams of psilocybin per 70 kilograms of body weight. And the control dose was one to two milligrams. As a point of reference, 22 milligrams of synthetic psilocybin would be equal to about four dry grams of psilocybin cubensis mushrooms. Uh, what they found was, uh, and I want to thank Matt Johnson of Johns Hopkins, uh, Professor Matt Johnson, for sharing these slides uh, with me, with us, and allowing us to use them, was that for the people who received the high dose, 70% of them said it was both the most meaningful, among the top five most meaningful life experiences, and also top five spiritually significant lifetime experiences. Uh, Griffiths says, look, this is, um, this is, these results are impressive. Uh, decreases in death anxiety, improvement in quality of life, meaning and optimis, optimism. And this is not only what the participants reported, but what the clinical observers saw. Leading Roland Griffiths to exclaim, as a scientific phenomenon, if you can create a condition in which 70% of the subjects achieve positive, lasting results in one or two sessions, exclamation point. Compare that to psychoanalysis. Um, I'm going to turn it back now to Julie, who's going to talk about her therapeutic work with guided imagery. Hello again. Uh, therapy with guided imagery. Uh, this comes out of the work of Asagioli um, called psycho Psychosynthesis. And um, guided imagery is a large part of that. I studied with um, in San Francisco uh, doing my graduate work. Uh, I studied with Harry Sloan, who was a student of um, Asagioli in his much later years. And he, he brought that work back to share with us in San Francisco and around the world, really. So um, guided imagery is a technique in which psychotherapists help clients focus on mental images in order to facilitate deep relaxation, healing, and resolution of life's issues. It's like, it's just one modality you can use. I mean, it was my specialty, is what I was trained in, but there are, other, there are many other types of um, techniques like hypnosis and, um, you know, NLP and different things that are also do the same thing. Um, in psychotherapy with guided imagery, the client can call on mental images to improve emotional and physical health, at times entering a state of mystical experience. Here we have a Johns Hopkins um, uh, Center um, therapy, psycho, psychotherapy, I'm sorry, psychedelic uh, session. Um, it's not psychotherapeutic because there are two people that are holding the space for the, the participant who is lying down with eye shades. As you can see, they just hold the space, but um, they don't really say much. Psychedelic, the psychedelic assisted therapy versus guided imagery therapy. So the John Hopkins protocol is non-directive encouraging psilocybin study participants to trust let, and let go and be open without providing any instructions on how or where to focus. In contrast, the guided imagery modality is directive, with the therapist focusing clients in order to evoke images and assisting clients in processing and integrating those images. Here we have two of my clients that um, went into full remission after their conventional treatment failed them. Um, client one is a man, a male. He was in his late 60s when he came to me. He was a physician. He had fourth stage prostate cancer. His treatment length with me was two years after conventional cancer treatment. 
Um, I love this guy because he, he sat down the first session and he said to me, I will do anything you ask me to do. And he just was so intently ready to change his life. And the reason, I'm, I'm, I want to correlate this with why he got prostate cancer, his perception of why he got cancer, um, prostate cancer. He had a cold and loving mother who never touched him and um, told him she didn't really love him. Um, he luckily had a father that was loving to him. But as he grew up and he married, the woman he married was just like his mother, um, cold and held back and not you know, a loving person to him. Um, so uh, that's because when someone is, has a lot of pain or trauma from the childhood, they usually choose the from the parent, the mother or the father, the one they had the most problems with because what they, they choose that, that partner so that they can work out the issues that are painful for them. And that doesn't always work out so well. In his case, it didn't. His wife left him, um, luckily, and he did find the love of his life. When he found the love of his life, some years later, but, um, he got cancer, prostate cancer. And his treatment was an orchiectomy, um, which is... Um, removal of the testicles. He had said many times in therapy how he felt castrated by his mother and castrated by his father. So Jeff, that just kind of shows you how the emotions, what the, the effect of the emotions can be on a person's health. Um, but luckily, he did a lot of work with me and his um, outcome his main mystical experience was unity and oneness and authentic self. His outcome was anxiety reduced, full remission as verified by clients, by his oncologist. And he lived until his, uh, his late um, middle eighties um, and was fine for all those years. Um, my second client is a female. She wanted to, she was in graduate school in Florida, but she wanted to go far away from her graduate school to another graduate school to do her PhD. And um, she had third stage breast cancer. She was with me for one and a half years after her conventional cancer treatment, um, which wasn't working well. And she, her, her guided image was her warrior self. So when she um, and her main mystical uh, experiences were elements, were beyond time and space and positive mood. Now these are the outcomes of her therapy, right? Um, the, she, she was really afraid. She told me she was really afraid of leaving her doctor and me um, to go to graduate school. She was afraid that her cancer would come back again. And um, I said to her, well, you know, why don't you just look for a sign that you know will, will say to you, you are going to be fine. And the next morning she called me and she said, you're not going to believe this, but I had an amaryllis plant on my balcony for over two years and it never bloomed after the first time. And I came out that morning to, to get my to drink my tea, and there is my amaryllis in full bloom with all three flower flowers. And she said, and I know everything's gonna be okay. And it was. Uh, psychotherapy with cancer patients. 
when you come go into a a um, therapist's office and you sit down and you have this feeling between you, this chemistry and this feeling that feels really, really good here. Trust that because trust between a client and a therapist is the key to successful psychotherapist, psychotherapy, excuse me, and healing. I'm gonna need some water. It's the key to successful psychotherapy. Other possible cancer healing modalities for healing cancer, um, and these are just a few. There are, are so many great ones that are alternative and complementary treatments for cancer. Is detoxification, really great um, nutraceutical nutrition, exercise, meditation, and a very promising one that I've seen here in Portugal heal people is full extract cannabis oil or FICA, which um, is great for healing cancer and is also great for pain. Some guided imagery questions are, can this anecdotal success in reducing tumors with guided imagery and psychotherapy be replicated and independently validated in a controlled study? That's very important. Um, we don't know the answer to that yet. Can psychedelic sessions be integrated into psychotherapy with guided imagery in order to accelerate the healing process? Two questions, we have no answers to them yet. Psychedelic therapy questions are, can psychedelic assisted psychotherapy be used not only to alleviate psychological anxiety and depression, but also to facilitate physiological healing in cancer patients? Um, <laughs> you have to see that too. Will long-term costly psychotherapy and psychiatry eventually be enhanced? by short-term, more affordable psychedelic psychotherapy. And the, the key there is the short time, short-term versus long-term therapy. Maybe you can have the same effects with both, but it takes a lot longer, as you see in my, with my clients, um, to do healing that puts a cancer patient in remission, full remission. I want to take the uh, the screen back and now come to uh, the, the macro kind of question. How does mystical experience actually heal? How does mystical experience occasioned by psychedelics, occasioned by guided imagery, uh, occasioned by dreams, according to Carl Jung, heal? Uh, Griffiths tells us that psych psilocybin enables the understanding that all is well in the largest frame. Well, what is that largest frame? Robin Carhart Harris, working with uh, MRI images of the brain before and after psychedelics, finds that psychedelics surpass the brain's default mode network, sort of its, its the, the basic software, and moves it into new superhighways of the unconscious. Carl Jung identified the spiritual self which can be accessed from the unconscious in dreams. And it is that spiritual self that brings forth the inner wisdom, the guidance, the knowledge for self-healing. And I want to focus on this particular issue uh, as we conclude. Um, this is the image that Carhart Harris uh, published related to before and after magic mushrooms. And you can see on the left-hand side of the image, the brain in its default mode network with uh, a small amount of neural connections and pathways taking place. And look what happens uh, under magic mushrooms. Uh, there is a virtual profusion of new pathways that are uh, created. Uh, another way of looking at this is, this is your brain before, this is your brain on LSD, literally. 
again from the Imperial College in London, uh, kind of the anecdote for Nancy Reagan's old uh, anti-drug campaign, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. Um, I want to go now to Stanislav Grof's work because a key assumption or premise that Julie verifies clinically uh, of this whole question is, is there an emotional, an emotional component to cancer? And in The Human Encounter with Death, uh, published in 1977, Groff, who worked with Bill Richards, who worked with Walter Pankey, said, we saw surprisingly frequent instances of severe guilt, feelings of self-hatred, and auto-punitive tendencies that have preceded the clinical manifestation of cancer by years or decades. In fact, Groff found it was not infrequent that cancer patients in their LSD sessions saw direct links between such tendencies within themselves and their malignancies. Uh, this has been documented in other research and I think this gives you the big picture. Uh, if you want to follow up or ask us questions, you can find us at psychedeliggospels.com, on Facebook, Psychedelic Gospels. Here's my email address. Any questions you have for me or Julie, we will answer each and every one of them. And there's a condensed version of this uh, presentation on a blog in Psychedelics Today on May 28th. Uh, the last two things, I'll be offering my psychedelics and culture course online, fully accredited, and non-Florida International University students anywhere in the world can enroll for credit. Email me and I'll send you information on it. Um, like to end by saying in conclusion related to mystical experience, we'll end and open up for questions. Uh, hopefully these reflections on mystical experience and psychotherapy will inspire further explorations of this unique phenomena that facilitates creativity, personal growth, healing, and well-being. Jessica, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Jerry and Julie. That was such an incredible talk. I have some questions that people have been sending us, and I will lead with a couple. Those of you who have questions for Jerry and Julie, now is the time to submit them in the question and answer se uh, section. Um, but I wanted to ask actually, um, Julie, I just wanted, I'm so fascinated by your work. I wanted to ask um, just specifically, are you saying that some cancers have uh, an emotional basis? Yes. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that emotions and cancer are interrelated much, much more than the um, conventional medical system believes. I'd like to add something to that. And in making that statement, um, we are not naive about the role of toxins in creating cancer. Uh, I worked on a many, many years ago on a pesticide campaign of farm workers who were getting cancer in the San Joaquin Valley in California due to uh, dangerous pesticides. Julie and I uh, conducted or were part of a team doing a radiation study of uh, levels of strontium-90 and its relationship to cancer. And uh, Julie, in terms of talking to people on preventing cancer, has made people very aware of the dirty dozen chemicals, cleaning chemicals you can have in your house, mm -hmm. the beauty products that contain carcinogens. So we're not naive about the role of toxins in causing cancer. The question is, what is the role of the emotions in purely causing cancer or in determining which people exposed to toxins will actually end up with a cancer? We want to make that addition there. Also, yeah. Dr. Hammer, um, German doctor, um, did a large study. I think it was over a thousand patients um, that had cancer, and he could actually correlate the the place that, um, in the brain to the organ that they got cancer in. And what he said was that all this whole population of cancer patients, they 
all had their cancer. They had cancer two to three years before. I mean, I'm sorry, after a um, severe, a severe traumatic event in their lives. So that also shows it. Mm -hmm. That's a, thank you for answering that for us. I have another question here that I'm going to ask you from Dave. He said, great talk. <clears throat> what would be some examples of the guided imagery you discuss with your clients? What would be the an example? Oh, I mean, oh, an example, the idea of imagery. Um, some of the examples I gave were um, um, that my clients, that they're uh, the warrior part of them, that came from a visualization that I did with her to um, bring her to meet someone, a guy, like a guy that would, would help her in her life. And that was um, what came up for her was that image of, a, of her warrior self. Um, is that good enough? <laughs> Absolutely. How about, here's from Sheila. She asks, how receptive is the palliative and hospice care community to these types of therapies? Um, I can just say that I fought with every oncologist that my clients had. <laughs> I, and they would never, ever open their minds to the possibility of the fact that their their client had healed from guided imagery, um, change of diet, meditation, any of these things. They said, impossible, don't talk to me, get out of here. So that was, I know that was a long time ago and things have changed, I know things have changed, but I wonder how much. And, and here, I mean, one of the, the big points that uh, Stanislav brought, I mean, I think the most brilliant person on the planet, with you know decades of leading thousands of psychedelic LSD psychotherapy and other uh, uh, homotropic breathwork sessions, has said in his um, opus, his book, uh, The Way of the Psychonaut, which came out in 2019, that I recommend for everyone interested in this field, that what we're dealing with, what psychedelics, he, he originally said that, look, psychedelics are gonna be to the mind what the microscope was to biology, what the telescope has been to astrophysics. And psychedelics is shifting the paradigm in so many areas. And this will be, uh, this, this really requires a revisioning of psychotherapy. And it's also going to impact on medicine in this way. I mean, I remember when my father was dying of cancer and I stood out there in the hallway with the uh, associate oncologist from Sloan Kettering and I'd gone to Cornell, he'd gone to Cornell Medical School, and I said, well, what do you think the chances are of this radiation and this chemotherapy? And he looked up the hall this way, and he looked up the hall that way to make sure no one was listening. He said, Jerry, it's all experimental. We don't really, I can give you numbers, percentages, we do that to give people comfort, but we don't really know. So um, we have a long way to go, a lot of education to do, but it's conferences like this um, that really, do this and the people who are listening in, the next generation of people who will uh, understand, integrate, educate, do research on psychedelics are gonna take this to the next level. The science is, is dramatic. Absolutely, absolutely. I um, see a couple of questions on here and I think some people are unclear um, um, regarding the uh, guided imagery. Um, some people are asking whether or not you had had the chance to use psychedelics with a guided therapy at that time, or if this is something that you're proposing would be an excellent way to, to deepen that work. Okay, so second first, um, yes, um, I'm not, Second question. Are, is psychedelics a way to deepen the guided imagery of work that you do? That's what I don't know. I, I, I really don't have the answer to that. I've never been a, I've never had the chance to use psychedelics 
in my work because I've been retired since 2012. And um, I, I wish I could have had it, but I didn't. And um, so I guess somebody else is going to have to study um, guided imagery as a psycho, you know, that's a psychotherapist and do, and do psychedelics and see for them themselves. But also um, the, the guided imagery, there's an excellent book that I used back in my practice called What We May Be by, um, yeah, I think it's by Ferrucci. He was an he was a a um, colleague of um, Asagioli. And so, you know, this, I mean, these substances were illegal uh, for all the time that Julie was doing her practice. But what the important point here is the recognition that one uh, guided imagery predictably and reliably and frequently brings about mystical experience in psychotherapy. So can the use of that enhance therapist training? Can the use of that have the dramatic effect of going beyond what Johns Hopkins and several others have found in the sense that psychedelics affects psychological conditions, addiction, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder. Now we're asking another kind of question. Given the emotional component of something as pervasive as cancer, can psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, perhaps in combination or out of combination with guided imagery, empower people to heal from the physiological disease of cancer. And I just want to stress, uh, Julie's never claimed that she heals people. What she is is a facilitator who helps people access their spiritual wisdom to heal themselves. Absolutely. And that's such powerful work. Thank you for clarifying that for everyone. Um, let's see, we have a few more interesting questions here. Just wanted to go to one that actually has to do um, with your work about your book, The Psychedelic Gospels. Um, Bristol Carver asks, The Psychedelic Gospels, he says, he just finished reading your book. Um, he says, you call for a council of multidisciplinary researchers, like art historians, anthropologists, etc., to continue to examine questions around the role of sacred mushrooms in early Christianity. Can you speak to the progress of that council and or these types of research questions? Sure. Uh, we've had significant interest, both internationally and across the disciplines. By that, I mean art historians, medieval historians, theologians, um, classical Greek and Roman scholars. Uh, however, uh, this is sort of like uh, herding cats because people are so deeply involved in their own research that um, I think the interest is there whether this interdisciplinary committee will come together uh, is, remains a question mark. Uh, that doesn't preclude people from being their own psychedelic explorers, taking our book and using it um, sort of as a uh, roadmap for doing their own explorations. Uh, Julie and I were very excited to learn that our book, The Psychedelic Gospels, is being translated into Russian and will come out in the Russian language next spring. And in our preface uh, to the Russian edition of the book, we asked, who knows what treasures of uh, psychedelic icons they'll find in the Hermitage, one of the greatest art collections in the world, in the... Um, resplendent um, Roman, uh, um, Russian Orthodox church, and in the petroglyphs that the uh, Siberian reindeer herders and their ancestors have left behind, where we know there have been mushroom images from a thousand years ago carved in the petroglyphs there. So there's a lot of research, uh, just as in this area, we've got our toe in the water. Uh, the same with the psychedelic gospels. We um, we feel it's opening the door and there's much more research uh, that can be done to document this theory. 
Absolutely. It's so fascinating, that work that you're doing. We're um, almost out of time, but I just want to make sure there's been a couple of different questions here um, that are looking for um, further education and recommendations, for example. Um, one person, Matthew, was asking um, if you could recommend a book on guided imagery for cancer patients specifically. Um, is there something that you can recommend or a resource? Um, I, you know, I've been out of the loop um, as far as books go for, can uh, for guided imagery, but um, I think that, do you have any ideas? Okay, yeah, um, yeah, well, she was like the beginning, that's true. Um, I think um, that if she looks, oh, I know, how about uh, San Francisco, um, um, down the school, what's it called? Oh, uh, this, no, oh, not okay. on the school. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's, yeah, in Santa Barbara. The California yeah. Institute for Integral Studies Yes. Uh, might be a good place mm -hmm. to uh, pose that question. However, uh, send us an email and we'll look into that yeah. and get back to you. Uh, so JB Brown at gate.net are uh, related to courses. Uh, you're going to find you go online and uh, look at psychedelic courses. There are a growing number of organizations that are offering short courses on anything as specific to microdosing to psychedelics in general. Uh, my course, Psychedelics and Culture, Past, Present, and Future, is sort of a comprehensive overview of psychedelics and past, the psychedelic renaissance, and where we're going towards the future when we fully integrate the potential, the human potential, and the healing potential of psychedelics. Uh, we haven't talked a lot today about psychedelics for healthy people and human potential, mm -hmm. creativity, scientific problem solving, but that is a vast area. So we touch on all of this in the course, and if someone's interested in that, uh, please email me and I'll send you the syllabus and enrollment uh, information. And uh, enrollment starts in November and classes start in January. Great. Thank you for that. I have another question here. Um, this one is asking from an anonymous attendee um, who is looking for, as a therapist, further education. What sort of training could you recommend for someone who is a therapist working in the field who wants to begin working with guided imagery or possibly a psychedelic assisted therapy? Yeah, I would say that um, there's two places that you can look. Uh, the primary place is the California Institute of Integral Studies, CIIS, uh, which offers a, a certificate in psychedelic therapy and research. This is excellent preparation. Also, if you go on the MAPS website, uh, maps.org, and look around on current research programs, uh, you'll find things related to therapist training. You'll find things related to looking for uh, partic qualified participants in research that's taking place. Uh, but there are uh, other therapy trainings taking place, and if you Google them, uh, training in psychedelic psychotherapy, um, you will find many resources now. Uh, you can also look at Jim Fadiman's wonderful book, The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide, Jim Fadiman, The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide. I believe Jim's doing a workshop uh, or has done one for this program. And he has a lot of resources on therapy training and on the development of guides. Absolutely. Those are great recommendations. I can also see on the chat that a lot of people are weighing in and they also have other uh, resources to extend to the other people in this group, which I think is great. I think that's so beautiful about the psychedelic community. It's such a family, so much sharing. So I'm absolutely thrilled to see that everybody is here participating and sharing along the way. I want to say thank you. A very special thanks to Jerry and Julie Brown. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us as we wrap up our special time together this morning, afternoon? Yeah, I just want to say to all of our brothers and sisters mm -hmm. on the path with heart of psychedelics, um, I, we, we have found for over 50 years, this, if you're treating it respectfully, being uh, having integrity with the research, that this is a path that keeps on growing and growing and is blossoming 
into a full-blown renaissance. And we wish you Godspeed in all of your work on this as well. And thanks to Daniel and the team that put this event uh, together. Uh, thank you for having us here. Thank you both so much. What an incredible talk. What beautiful work you do. Thank you for your work. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you everyone who came here to expand their knowledge and to learn about this incredible research that they're doing, the, the hand that you're reaching out to show all of the connections with, with religion, the effect that our emotions have in our bodies, the way that we can affect that with this incredible medicine. I believe that we can call it that now. I thank you so much. I uh, thank you for sharing and I look forward to the rest of the conference. Have a beautiful day, everyone. All right, I'm gonna post some comments here in the chat and then we will see you guys soon. Have a great day. Take care. Take care. Take care.